So it must have been one of those very few properly sunny days in London. Because I remember I decided to put on a summery dress. And as I walked out of my apartment, I could still feel the cold air on the bare skin of my legs. And already some of the first sunshine is hitting my face. And I felt glorious. And as I was almost at my office, a, a young man has overtaken me and, and he got to the front of me and, and stopped me with this hand gesture. And he said, I just wanted to tell you that you look beautiful. I came back home the same night and I told my husband all about it um, and how amazing it had made me feel. Um, sometimes you just need to hear those things from another person to truly believe them. So as the years have gone by, I've gotten back to that memory from time to time. It was nothing significant, but it gave me the sort of warm and nice, fond feeling. I can't think fondly of this memory ever again. And this is the man right here who has ruined my memory. He's known as Tom Torero, and he's one of what I refer to as pickup artists, the modern day Casanovas, who have thousands and thousands upon thousands of women as their conquerors, and even more followers to whom they teach the art of seduction. So I've lately found out that Tom Torero teaches his underlings to open with the ladies by overtaking them in the street in the middle of a day, stopping them with this hand gesture, you know where it's going to, and telling them, I think I wanted to tell you, I think you look very beautiful today. Please back. <coughs> now, Tom, or whatever his real name is, is not the only pickup artist out there. Um, and not even one of the most famous ones, the international accolades would go most likely to his friends. That's Styles, you have Mystery, Th they all have ridiculous nicknames. Yes, Tyler Durden, um, that's Matador, yeah, <laughs> that's Discovery, and Ross Jeffries, and that's actually his real name because he's been in the game for longer than the nicknames, as you can tell. You might be thinking right now, I mean, is that for real? Are those guys actually picking up on girls this way? Are they, I mean, seriously? And how? I mean, they're not exactly that much to look at. Yet, they are masters at managing and playing social dynamics. They are masters at using your insecurities against you. They all have their own game, but the general premise is always the same. You want to scout the talent, open, lower her guard, and then close the deal. They will look for your insecurities, they'll amplify them, and then they will give you an easy solution, a temporary patch, a night with them. And don't worry, if you get cold feet at the last minute, uh, or, as, or, or as they would call it, the LMR, the last minute resistance, uh, they have a whole inventory of tricks up their sleeve that will make it uh, easier for you to concede. What a long way have we gone from the times of the personal ads in newspapers. You have an example here, a uh, handsome young man, gainfully employed, looking for a young, healthy, musical lady for the purpose of matrimony. No embellishment, straight to the point. But I guess it was a sign of times. In 1838, when Procter and Gamble has published their first print ad, it looked like this. No embellishments, straight to the point. But just as the art of seducing the ladies has evolved over the last two centuries, so has the art 
of seducing customers. Goodness. We have gone from the functional to the inspirational. We have been told that we can live any dream that we want to live. The height of the madman times, the 50s and the 60s, the golden era of dream selling, would have you believe that you could be anyone. You could be part of that healthy, happy family. You could have a luxurious lifestyle as long as you drove the Cadillac. Or you could even go to the moon to clean it, of course. <laughs> the advertisers have learned how to flirt or as they would call it, provide you with emotional benefits. Now, there is nothing innately wrong about a brand giving you an emotional benefit, just like there is nothing wrong with flirting. Let me give you an example. The phones you have on you in your pockets, in your purses, they all make phone calls, they all take photos, they all open apps. Those are all functional benefits. But depending on the brand of the phone that you have on you, it might give you a sense of cool superiority or that you are part of the in crowd or quite the contrary, that you actually are free and you don't follow the herd. And that's called emotional benefit. There is nothing innately wrong about a brand giving you an emotional benefit and even charging you for it. If the brand promises you that you will feel cool and it makes you feel cool, so be it. But the pickup artists, they go beyond flirting. And so do some brands. Some brands and some advertisers go all the way into the territory of manipulating the social interactions. They go in the territory of trying to find out your psychological weaknesses, amplifying them, and then giving you an easy fix, their product. And just like the pickup artists, they also have a whole inventory of dirty tricks up their sleeve to make sure that you concede. Let me give you an example of that, okay? Um, let's take a target customer. How about mothers of young children? I could identify with that one. Ever busy, wanting absolute best for their children, but without the time to do it all. Burdened with millions of do's and don'ts, exhausted, exhilarated, all at the same time. And this, yet, despite everything they do, one of their deepest insecurities is that they're just not good enough as mothers. So when it comes to selecting a snack for their kids, that insecurity leads the mothers of young children to think, I want a snack for my kid that is yummy, but that is also good for them that is healthy, yet will make them happy. A solution? Kudos bar. Let's have a closer look at the kudos bar right here. So it, it, it is with M&Ms, so it must be good. Um, I'm sure it's going to make your kids happy. So far, so good. Yeah? It also is about wholesomeness, balance, goodness, granola, low calories, low fat, and even has calcium. It is obviously healthy. Win-win. Or so you want your target to think. Even though this granola bar is not particularly healthy, full of sugar, heavily processed, with artificial flavorings and preservatives, you haven't technically lied to the customer. You haven't exactly said that it's healthy. By the way, you'd be prohibited to say that legally in the US at least. But you have created an aura of healthiness around it. What you have done is provided a temporary emotional patch to cover up the insecurity of your target customer. You have made the mothers feel a bit better about themselves for a short moment of time. And it is entirely possible that if they use your product, 
their insecurities are actually going to go worse in the long run. Truth be told, there's nothing new about it. In the 1940s, um, the first studies started coming up in the US saying that smoking might cause cancer. Some people got worried, naturally. However, as has as always been, uh, quitting was not that easy and there was a certain social appeal of smoking. So some people asked, should I stop smoking in order to save my health? Down! Doctor smoke! So it's all right! And you can feel completely healthy while smoking, as long as you smoke the brand which all of the doctors smoke as well. If this was a pickup artist, this would be equivalent of having the pickup artist go, um, you are worried about being too promiscuous? Don't! I once slept with a nun, so you can totally feel chased while hopping into bed with me. And if the next day you feel a bit worse about your sex life than before, oh well. Now, some brands have been in the business of seduction for much longer. And so they not only learn how to be more effective, but they've also learned how to be a bit more subtle. And that makes it that much more difficult for us as consumers to spot their game. In the early years of the 20th century, uh, Gillette was a leading brand of uh, men's shaving products in the US. And if you think that's a good place to be, it's not. Uh, imagine you are selling a product that a customer can, can use only that much of. And you're already a market leader. Your only hope for increasing sales is population growth. Unless you convince the other half of the population, women, to use your product. So we have women. What are they most worried about? What's their biggest insecurity? That they're going to be unloved and alone. Fantastic. Let's give them what they've been asking for. Let's give them the love that they want. Let's give them the sense of belonging that they need. Let's give them the feeling that they're right on trends. Even though between you and some of the other market players, you're the ones who are creating this trend through ads, through paid unbranded articles, through objective publicity, and many others. Oh, well. Now, in mark marketeers talk, this would be called educating the market. Educating the market, yes. And it's a methodology that has worked for a lot of brands, not just Gillette. I don't want to point, pinpoint here one specific brand. Now, Gillette has used it very successfully for a good century. When the Berlin Wall fell, they've used it to educate Eastern European women that they need to shave themselves. They've used the same methodology to educate Mexican men that they need to shave to get a girl. In the literal words of the agency behind this campaign, how do you get men to shave more? You give them more to shave, that's how! Spoken with pride. Now over time, Gillette has gotten much more subtle with their messaging. Today they're using uh, messages of empowerment to sell their the Venus, their female products line. No more crude, shave to be loved messaging. Because women want to be empowered. So be a goddess. And shave like a woman. Like what? Everywhere below my neckline? Who cares that Gillette does not empower women to do anything? It provides them with a temporary emotional patch to address an insecurity over a body issue they have participated in creating.
Now, not every emotional benefits are bad. Emotional benefits are not innately bad, just like flirting is not innately bad. It's okay to make women feel empowered and then empower them. Nike has a long history of doing it. It's okay to make people feel healthy and then make them healthy. But if your product can neither make the customer healthy, nor empowered, nor address any other of their, their needs that you might think are sexy at the moment, just focus on what you can deliver. Or focus on fixing your product. There are many ways, and many more, in which we are being tricked. Brands have all of those different ways. That they can play on your deepest fears, for example, like a fear of losing a house, or losing a limb, or losing a family member, or, or, or dying yourself and then the consequences of that on your family. They can play on your decision biases. The shortcuts, mental shortcuts, which we all take, which we've been evolutionarily designed to take, when making decisions, like, for example, dependence on others to make our choices, or valuing more the things that are more scarce, or choosing out of habit, and hundreds, literally hundreds more that we already know we're all susceptible to. Some brands will even go further. They will completely bypass your reason and go straight to your subconscious. For example, spraying a scent of freshly baked cookies in shopping malls to make you buy more. Or playing French music to make you choose the French wine over the German one. And if you think that you yourselves are not susceptible to those tricks, I have a surprise for you. We've played a trick on you earlier today. As you entered the venue, some of you were asked to provide an answer to a one-question survey, a little TED trivia game, as we called it. And the card for that looked more or less like this. The question is absolutely irrelevant. What's relevant is the number of the question that's on the top. Some of you were given a card that said it's a question number 26. Others have gotten a card that said it was a question number 74. And when I counted the averages, the ones who got the 26 scored at about 40%, and the ones with the 74, around 50%. And I know what you're going to tell me. You have not even looked at the number. You didn't even realize it was there. It couldn't have affected you. You just don't even know it was there. I know. And that's the point. Just like when you enter a big shop and there are all of those screens with messages you don't even notice, that's the point. Welcome to the world of priming. Now, the list of the ways in which we can be misled keeps on growing. The last decade has been a time of amazing advancement in neuroscience. That enabled the economists, the psychologists, the cognitive scientists, pickup artists and marketeers to discover more ways in how our way in more ways in which our brain works and in which it can fail. Right now is the era of behavioral economics. Right now is the time when our brain's biases, the problems we have, all of our weaknesses, emotional, mental, psychological, get bared. And it's becoming just so easy for those who want to get into your pants or into your wallets to do so. So what can you do? As a consumer, be 
mindful. And if you've been badly gamed, don't feel ashamed of having been manipulated. Don't feel guilty. It truly is not your fault. If you have been abused, do what you should do in any abusive relationship. Leave. Now, there are times when you might have the strength to overcome your insecurity, and there might be times when you won't. But in the very least, don't stay in a relationship with a pickup artist. And if you are a marketeer or a future business leader, I know there will be plenty of times when you will have a lot of pressure on the sales numbers, on the targets, and you'll want to succeed. I truly hope you do. But in your quest for success, remember, life is not only about closing the deal. You do have options. Because even the best of the pickup artists with the highest scores end up lonely and alone. Thank you.